How many of you guys have ever built a house? Maybe not physically, but you had a house built. Just kind of give me a little bit of a hand raise right there. All right. I've never been a part of that process, but I know it is a process, right? There's a lot of things that go into it. A lot of things, decisions that need to be made early on. Uh, Because once the foundation is laid, Shelly and I actually tried to build a house one time and they laid the wrong foundation. Uh, We drove past it one day and I was like, and we're done. Box checked. (laughs) Uh, That was our best effort right there. And so uh, we pulled back and ended up buying an older home uh, in in a couple of months. But what if your best friend came to you and said, you know what, I'm going to build this house. I'm going to do things a little differently than everybody else. I'm going to wait till the end to put in the plumbing. We're going to see how that goes. I think everybody puts it in too early. So I'm going to wait for the studs to go up, the the foundation to be poured, the studs to go up, the, the drywall to come in, the roof there, all the appliances to come in, and then we're going to lay some beautiful, beautiful plumbing. What if they did it with electricity? I just said, hey, I'm going to wait to the end. We're going to see how things go, where we need electricity, and then we're just going to put it right through the walls, right? What would you say to your friend? Would you be like, hey, uh, people do this like for reasons, right? They, they, They lay the foundation for a reason. They, they put the plumbing in early and then the plumber keeps having to come back. The electrician keeps having to come back over and over. I would, I, I listened to a podcast with Mike Rowe, the other guy, the guy from Dirty Jobs the other day, and these guys were talking about building houses, and so I felt like the end of it, I could do it. And so, just kidding. Uh, at the end of it, I was like, I would be lost. Too many decisions, too much to, to think about. I think I am going to trust the people who do this for a living. So Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, has a plan, and in that plan, He prays, and he mourns, and he fasts for the state of Jerusalem. And then he prays some more. He has the king's permission to go. He has the supplies that he needs, not only to help build the gates and start building the walls, but to build a house for himself. He has a plan, and he's going to call some other people to come alongside of him to carry out that plan. He is not distracted from the task at hand. He goes to Jerusalem with a picture in his head. And of course, things probably were worse than they were were described to him when he got there. But he knows that this is the plan to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah 6.15 tells us that the wall was finished in 52 days. So that means in Nehemiah chapter 3, we're about July, August of 445 B.C. So just so you know, this chapter is not the chapter you want to read out loud. If you came to Sunday school and they said, hey, you read Nehemiah 3 out loud, where are you going to listen? You probably wouldn't go back (laughs) because you'd think those people don't love me. And so today, as I uh, read this out loud, you pray for me, okay? Because there's no expert in the room to read these names, okay? And so I've listened to multiple people read it this week. Still, it's still, uh, when I get to a name, I'm going to mess it up. So you feel normal, and then I'll feel encouraged by your uh, not as much laughter. Don't laugh too much, okay? Hey, I'm going to break it up in parts because it is a difficult text, and I'm going to kind of explain it on the way, and then we're going to, uh, we'll, you'll see the, the end uh, in a minute. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers and the priest, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakur, the son of Emery, built. So I want you to check out this map that's on the screen for you. I got it right out of the ESV Study Bible. What you're going to see in these these verses, we're going to start at the north, at the Sheep Gate, and we're going to work counterclockwise. That's how Nehemiah is going to write the verses, right? So he's going to make his way through all of these gates. And so uh, Nehemiah actually gives us quite a description of how Jerusalem looked like at this time. There are other maps. You could find other maps. But you can see that he kind of outlines this uh, area, and those are the gates, and those are the walls that he and his people that he's leading are going to try to rebuild. So as we work counterclockwise, let me just describe it to you. We're going to go from the Sheep Gate to the Tower of the Hundred to the Tower of Hananel to the Fish Gate. 
Then you're going to see the gate of Yeshino, which is sometimes called, the, some people think it's the old gate. Then you're going to get down to the tower of the ovens. So you'll see some question marks by it, right? Because they're not exactly sure this is where these things were. But then there's the valley gate, the lower pool, the king's garden, the dung gate, the fountain gate, the wall of Ophel, the horse gate, the muster gate, the corner gate, and then you're back to the sheep gate. And so that's how these verses are going to lay out. So verses 1 and 2. The sheep gate is in the northeast corner of the city. Since the sacrifices came into the city that way, the priests would be especially interested in that part of the project. And so that's why I think Nehemiah starts right there. This gate reminds us of Jesus, the Lamb of God who died for the sins of the world. Nehemiah could have begun his record with any of the gates, but he chose to start with the sheep gate which leads us to remember that apart from Jesus and his sacrifice, we would have nothing eternal and satisfying. There really would be no reason for us to be in the room today other than to socialize. But without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we gather in vain. So I think Nehemiah starts with this gate on purpose. Look at verse 3. The sons of Hassanah, built the fish gate, they laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired. And next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, son of Meshazabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired. But their nobles would not stoop to serve their lord. So you got the fish gate, it's located on the west of the sheep gate. Merchants sold fish on the northern side of Jerusalem. The Tower of the Hundred, the Tower of Hananel were part of the city's defense system. They were close to the citadel where the soldiers guarded the temple. They protected that northern approach to the city because that was the most vulnerable part of the, uh, of the city. The rest of it had a landscape that kind of provided some natural protection, but the northern part is where armies could come in easily. So Joida, the son of Passiah, and Meshulam, the son of Besadiah, repaired the gates of Yeshina. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them repaired Melatiah, the Gibeonite, and Jaden, the Maranathite, the men of Gibeon and of Mizpah, the seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Next to them, Uziel, the son of Harhiah, goldsmiths, repaired. Next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, repaired. And they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Can we just stop right there? Do you see that? You got the goldsmiths and the perfumers working on the wall. Are these experts? Maybe they listened to Micro's podcast and they felt like they were. But uh, I'm guessing this was their first time to rebuild a wall. Verse 9, next to them, Raphiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half of the district of Jerusalem, repaired. Next to them, Jediah, the son of Haramath, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashabaniah, repaired. Malchijah, the son of Haram, and Hashab, the son of Pahath, Moab, repaired another section and the tower of the ovens. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Helahesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, Repaired he and his daughters. So verses 6 through 12, this is the gate of Yeshina, probably what is known as the old gate, the broad gate, mentioned in verse 8 and on the western side of the northern sector of Jerusalem. The tower of ovens is in verse 11. It's on the western side of Jerusalem. Verses 13 and following. Hanun, the, Hanun and the inhabitants of Zanah, Zanoah repaired the valley gate. They built it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars, and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. Melchijah, the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hecarim, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And Shalom, the son of Kol Hozik, Hozik, I'm just going to keep going, ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it and covered it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And he, re and he built the wall of the pool of Shelah on the garden of the king's garden, as far as the stairs that go down to the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, ruler of half the district of Bethzur, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David. 
as far as the artificial pool and as far as the house of the mighty men. After him, the Levites repaired Rahum, the son of Benai. Next to him, Hashabiah, ruler of half the district of Kaliah, repaired for his district. After him, their brothers repaired. Bavai, the son of Hanadad, ruler of half the district of Kaliah. Next to him, Ezra, the son of Jeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zebai, repaired another section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashab, the high priest. After him, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashab to the end of the house of Eliashab. Eliashib. After him, the priest, the men of the surrounding area repaired. After him, Benjamin and Hashab repaired opposite their house. And after them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, the son of, of Ananiah, repaired beside his own house. After him, Benui, the son of Hinnadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress and to the corner. Palal, the son of Uzai, repaired opposite the buttress in the tower, projecting from the upper house of the king at the, guard, at the court of the guard. After him, Padiah, the son of Parash, and the temple servants living on Ophel, repaired to a point opposite the water gate on the east and the projecting tower. After him, the Tekoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Okay. Summarize verses 15 through 27. This fountain gate was the southeast corner of the city. It was near the pool of Siloam where Jesus heals the blind man in John chapter 9. The water tunnel was built by King Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20. References that the Gahon spring that fed the water system was an important source of water in the city. So verses 28 through 32. Above the horse gate. The priests repaired, each one opposite his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Emer, repaired opposite his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. And after him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the, son, the sixth son of Zelph, repaired another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Barachiah, repaired opposite his chamber. After him, Melchijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants, opposite the muster gate into the upper chamber of the corner. And between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. So verse 29, the east gate may have been the gate into the temple rather than a gate into the wall. Okay, The east gate led directly to the temple and is probably what we know as the golden gate. Tradition says that Jesus entered the temple on Palm Sunday through this gate. But in the 6th century, in 1541, the gate was sealed up with blocks of stone by the Turkish sultan, Solomon the Magnificent. Jewish and Christian tradition both connect the Golden Gate with the coming of the Messiah to Jerusalem. Did you catch that? So in 1541, this told this Turkish sultan sealed up that gate. Is that going to stop Jesus from coming back? No. Did death stop him from resurrecting? No. But I do want to point out, when we read Scripture, that we need to be very aware of how the world is against what we believe. You and I, as Christians, believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, right? Right? We believe that Jesus is coming back. Listen to what Ezekiel said in chapter 10 and 11. Ezekiel saw the glory of the Lord depart from the temple at the east gate, and the Lord will return the city the same way. So we have reason to associate this gate with the coming of the Lord. That's Warren Wiersbe's opinion about these gates and how important they are. Just so you know, I'm not going to read back through this whole section. Some of you are like, thank you. Okay? For those of you who went to bed late last night, you're like, thank you. Okay, that was tough enough, Tim, the first time. Let me give us a big idea about Nehemiah chapter 3, and I think it holds together with what we're going to, to look at in these verses when, we, when we've read them already. When the people of God each do their part for the advancement of the gospel and remain undistracted, God receives the glory He deserves. When the people of God each do their part for the advancement of the gospel and remain undistracted. God receives the glory he deserves. One more time. 
when the people of God each do their part for the advancement of the gospel and remain undistracted, God receives the glory he deserves. This morning, I'd like to talk to us and think about serving in the local church. The common theme of the morning is going to be, what is your part in the body of Christ? Verses 1 through 32 in Nehemiah chapter 3, their, their work of the building of the wall, they're restoring the gate. Let's remember what drove Nehemiah and all these people to restore this city. In chapter 1, Nehemiah heard about the condition of Jerusalem. He was thinking about safety of God's people, but he was more thinking about God's reputation to the nations surrounding Jerusalem. Nehemiah 2.17 says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. You see the Gentiles, the Gentile nations, delighted in mocking their Jewish neighbors because Jerusalem was in a state of brokenness. Listen to what Psalm 48, 1 through 3, how it describes Jerusalem. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised is in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. You see, these people were passionate about this city because God's name is at stake. For the most part, in today's world, the world ignores the church. The only time they pay attention to us is to ridicule us or when something goes wrong in the church, right? There's a controversy. There's a scandal. The world takes notice when one of those things happen, but we aren't serving the local church for our glory. So when those things happen, all we can do is repent and mourn, right? You and I, when we hear about a church where something goes wrong, we shouldn't gloat and go, well, maybe they'll come to our church. <laughs> you and I should weep and mourn that God's name and reputation are at stake. You see, the purpose of all ministry, of all serving, is the glory of God. Listen to what Jesus says in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 4. He prays, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So Jesus wanted to live a life that would bring God glory. Listen to Colossians 3.17. Paul writes this letter to the local church in Colossae. He says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you and I, as children of God, are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which the Bible says he has prepared in beforehand for us. So here, let me just kind of get your attention for a second. What good works has God prepared beforehand for you? It's saying that he thought about you and he's prepared from good works for you. This isn't one of those things where he's waiting to put in the plumbing. This is saying that the sovereign God of the universe has a plan for you. Nehemiah was a leader who planned his work and he worked his plan. Listen to what D.L. Moody says about the church. A great many people have got a false idea about the church. They have got an idea that the church is a place to rest in, to get into a nicely cushioned pew and contribute to the charities, listen to the minister, and do their share to keep the church out of bankruptcy is all they want. The idea of work for them, actual work in the church, never enters their minds. 1 Corinthians 12, the passage we read just a few minutes ago. Paul compares the individual Christians to members of the human body. Each member is important and each has a special function to perform. When I was in college, I was with uh, this group called Campus Crusade for Christ. We were living in Hawaii for the summer. And one of the guys on my summer project wrote this skit about this passage. And he says, the body of Christ needs all of its parts for it to work. 
And I still remember that somebody with the hand written on a little uh, a sheet of paper on their chest said, you don't need me. <laughs> and I can still remember as a college student understanding the gravity of the situation that when a part of the body is not doing its work, the body is not functioning the way it should function. In Nehemiah, the people are undistracted. They went to their gates, they saw their condition, and they are doing their parts. They use their two hands to do the work. I was talking to someone the other day, I can't even remember who it was, but he said, my mom used to tell me, you've got help at the end of, the, of your arms. <laughs> and what he was saying is, you've got two hands to do the work. God gave you hands, now get to work. Let's just repeat this one more time. Jesus is inviting us to join him in an all-play, everyday disciple-making movement. This is not for the Christian elite. It's an all-play. The words built, repaired, occur over and over in these verses in chapter 3. They're going to try to make the gate strong and firm. So here we go. I'm going to summarize verses 1 through 32 in this way. God uses all kinds of people. Amen? <laughs> Has God used all kinds of people in your life? He's used all kinds of people in mine. To be honest, sometimes he's used people that I thought he wasn't going to use. <laughs> Verse 1. Eliashib seems to get off to a great start consec consecrating these gates. But let me just fast forward to the end of this book in Nehemiah 13, verses 4 through 9. We're going to see Eliashib ally with the enemy. And he's going to create some serious problems for Nehemiah. In Nehemiah 13, 28, we learn that Eliashib's grandson married a daughter of Sanballat. Hey, just a heads up. You can't control who your grandson or granddaughter is going to marry. You might try, right? Some of you are like, I can. I was like, good luck with that, right? So we're not blaming him, but what we are clearly saying is that he kind of started off strong, but he does not finish well. Look at verse 5. Some people will not work. Some people will not work. Tekoa was a town about 11 miles from Jerusalem. Some of their people traveled to Jerusalem to help repair the gates and the walls. But verse Five says, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. What an awful example, right? How would you like that to be written about you for the rest of history to read? <laughs> but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. The Tekoites were not the only outsiders to come and help in Jerusalem. There were people from Jericho and Gibeon and Mizpah. Their loyalty to their nation and their, their Lord was greater than their own local interest. And, and listen to this clearly. They risked their lives to come and help and serve in Jerusalem. They left a safe place to come to a city that had no wall. And yet their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. You see, if we're talking about people in the church today, just like we're talking about the nobles of Tekoa, these kinds of people are consumers. They, they want the benefit of the work without doing the work. Yet the providers are the ones putting their hands to the plow and getting the work Done. I want everyone in here just to take a deep breath right now. If you leave here today and this message is not convicting to you, you haven't been listening. Because this message is convicting to all of us who have ears to hear. But let me just say this as we get into the rest of the points. Grace to you. But just because we have grace doesn't mean we don't need to hear hard truth. Everybody with me? All right, just take a breath. All right. If you feel like I'm like beating you over the head, realize I've already beat myself over the head. Okay? The Bible should penetrate our hearts. 
So let's look back at verse 15. I'm going to try my best to read it one more time. And Shalom, the son of Kol Hazit, I can't even do it, ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it and covered it and set its doors and its bolts and its bars. And he built the wall of the pool of Shelah of the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. I picked this verse. There are a couple of verses in here where it seems like one person is doing a lot of work. Some people do more work than others, and some people work harder than others. Anybody worked a job before where that's the case? I worked at Food World when I was in college. It was a grocery store in my hometown. And um, after a little bit there, I noticed that some of the bag boys, I was a bag boy, I was way up the food chain, okay? So some of the bag boys, they would just disappear. And one of them was with my, one of my friends at school. And so one day we're talking at school, and he said, man, I go in the back and take naps all the time. And I was like, I didn't think that was part of the job description that was given to me. But the bad part of that job description was that my dad worked at another grocery store that was connected to this grocery store. So when my friend told me that he goes in the back and takes naps, he had a fear or lack of fear for the managers in that grocery store. I, on the other hand, was willing to be fired from being a bag boy, but I had to go home and live in my dad's house. (laughs) And if I go back in the back and take a nap and then one of those managers calls my dad, I'm just saying, he would have come to the store and woken me up. And it would have been a rude awakening, right? Bag boy wouldn't have been the least of my problems. And so some people do more work than others. Some people work harder than others. That's just a reality in the human life. At the wall in Jerusalem and in the local church, this is a true statement. But in light of the advancement of the gospel, we must do as much as we can as long as the Lord enables us. Let me just ask you, how long is your as long as? How long is the Lord going to enable you? Did you sing the song earlier when you realized that your breath was on loan? How long do you have to serve the Lord? We don't know. But as long as the Lord enables us, for those who work more or harder, it is easy to become prideful and bitter. And so for those of us in the room who might struggle with that, let me just give us a reality check. Comparison is the thief of joy and the giver of bitterness. When you and I start to look around and notice people who aren't working as hard or who are doing more than than, than other people, that can be the moment where we get our joy stolen. And we create bitterness in our heart. And I'll just tell you that bitterness takes root and it takes more than a shovel to get it out. That you and I need to be very aware of what is going on in our hearts. So serving in the local church should be a grace-driven effort for God's glory. That's how you and I keep from letting comparison steal our joy and our giver of bitterness and be a giver of bitterness. You and I don't have to compare ourselves to the people around us. We don't. Social media and other things have said you do, but you don't. The Bible says, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There's your comparison. How are you feeling? Okay. I feel about as good as I do every day. <laughs> That's the standard. You're not the standard. I'm not the standard. He's the standard. You want to find a way to decrease job morale, start comparing work ethic and compensation and weight pulled. That'll bring the job morale down. Next. Verses 10, 23, 28 through 30. Some people need to start their work at home. See, the Bible says in Nehemiah 3, some worked on the gates near their homes. Billy Graham said this a few years ago. The true test of a Christian is the way he lives at home. The true test of a Christian is the way she lives at home. You can teach a really good Bible study and lead a really good mission trip. 
But I'll tell you, when the rubber hits the road is when you go home and things start to break down. (laughs) That's when your love of Jesus truly becomes apparent. The true test of a Christian is the way he lives at home, is the way she lives at home. And so what do we do about this? I want to invite you to something. Tonight, we're doing a gathering called Fight for the Family. And it's going to be an opportunity for you and I to come. And we're going to play some games together at the beginning. And then there's going to be an intentional teaching time at the end. We're going to have the the little ones in child care for, for the very first start. But the other ones are going to be with us because this is a family affair. So we're going to do some games together, and then there's going to be a time where there's some uh, little child care so the uh, adults in the room can get together and talk, and the topic of conversation is communication. Blink at me if you've ever had a problem communicating with someone in your family. (laughs) So when you walk in that room tonight, I will tell you, I'm going to step into that room just like you step in that room as somebody who is trying by God's grace to communicate better. That was my major in college, speech communication. How about that for a major? What does that mean? Unemployed. But uh, <laughs> luckily, luck, that's what that kind of leads to that, or being a DJ. And so uh, I chose a different route, Okay. So I call communication studies now. You think I'm, Shelley ever says that to me? Isn't that your major? No. Her major was English. You'd think we'd be pretty good at communicating, right? We're highly trained. But we're highly sinful. So I'm inviting you tonight to come. I'm inviting you to just say, hey, I don't have it all together, but I'd like to work on it. Let me just say it like this. You need to come. We might just fight. I might just start fights in your family. Just kidding, okay? (laughs) Good night. Okay, breathe a little bit. We must work together if we are to finish the work to the glory of God. We must work together if we are to finish the work to the glory of God. So right now I'm going to do something that's kind of strange. We're going to look at two ministry models As your pastor, I want to say to you today that I want to explain the model that we use here at Crosspoint. I want you to know that what we mean when we say discipleship, what we mean when we say serving, should be very clear. It should not be shady. In the engagement model, you're going to find that discipleship is a ministry in the local church. And in the empowerment model, discipleship is a the ministry. So let me just walk through these one by one. A lot of churches uh, use the engagement model. There are some good parts of it. And you're going to say to yourself today, when you see the word connect, who doesn't want to connect here? Who came in here thinking, I'm good? (laughs) I hope you didn't, because you aren't. So you're going to see some good parts under the engagement model. But what I want us to see clearly is the empowerment model. It might seem like we're switching topics here in a second. Serving is part of discipleship. Let me make this very clear. If you are not willing to serve, you have misunderstood following Jesus and making disciples. Cheap seats. If you aren't willing to serve, you have misunderstood following Jesus and making disciples because he was a servant king. So here we go. The engagement model, you have connect is the purpose. And under the empowerment model, you have train as the purpose. In order to connect, you're going to develop deep friendships. You're going to develop some some of your best friends. and, And we want that, right? We desire that. But under the training model, we want, you to tr- we want to train you in disciple-making skills to send you out to make disciples. You can feel the differences with the purposes when you try to replicate. Let me just give you something. You might want to write this down. What you win me with, you win me to. 
What you win me with, you win me too. So if you win me with connecting, with deep relationships, and I'm going to make the best friends I've ever had, and I'm going to grow spiritually, then why would I ever leave those friends and go start another discipleship group? And we're not saying today that you have to leave those friends, as in you can't be friends with them anymore. But when you lead with training, that multiplication now has a purpose. When we started D groups, discipleship groups in February 2021, some of you were not attending here yet. And so some of this is going to sound very unfamiliar to you. But some of you uh, may have heard these rumors of D groups. Uh, one of our, our newest members said to me one time, I think D groups are a secret society at Cross Point. I'll just tell you, I take full ownership of that. I understand exactly what they meant by that statement. When we first launched D groups, we were just trying to figure this out as very organic. We held an information meeting in this group, in this, in this room about D groups, and I did my best to explain the model of discipleship that I was talking about, and I asked for people to lead a D group to gather their own people, and to lead a D group. You see, a D group, when we say D group, we mean a year-long commitment for three to five people who want to experience accelerated, intentional, spiritual growth. Did you say year-long, Tim? Actually, it can go 12 to 18 months. That's a long time. You're exactly right. That's not a semester Bible study. You're exactly right. That's not a summer Bible study. You're exactly right. That is a year-long commitment. In these groups, this is what goes down in a D group, in case you're like, why is it so secret? It's not secret, so here we go. You read through the Bible five days a week, and you journal about it using the HEAR method, which is highlight, explain, apply, and respond. You highlight one verse, you explain it, you apply it to your life, and you respond. Sometimes the response is a prayer that you write out. Does that mean that you don't read the Bible those other two weeks? That's not the other two days. No. It's just saying that you would read the Bible for five days a week and you would journal about it. You memorize two verses each week from the Sermon on the Mount. I'll just tell you, that got really real after like Matthew chapter 5. Toward the end of chapter 5, it got harder and harder. You talk about who's your one. What does that mean? Who is the one person you are sharing the gospel with? And so in your D group setting, in this small group of setting, you're saying this person's name and I want to influence them for the cause of Christ. And we're praying together for that person by name on a weekly basis. The other thing, you hold each other accountable. You ask each other some hard questions. You share some things that you struggle with, and you let the other people in that group know that they have the freedom to come into that space in your life. And you pray for each other. That's what the meeting will look like every single week. Didn't even have to guess what we were going to do the next week, because that next week we were going to do that same rhythm over and over. So basically, you and your D group are practicing spiritual disciplines together on a weekly basis. This model is very intentional. It is, it is purpose for accelerated spiritual growth. Here's the secret society part of it. They are closed groups, which means once you start, there's no more adding people. Why do we do that? Because this fosters trust. This fosters vulnerability. I shared things in my D group that not many other people knew about me. And the other men in my D group shared some very vulnerable things. And I'll just be honest with you, for a group of men, it took us a while. Are you there, fellas? You just go through Walmart just sharing all your stuff? I don't. It probably took me, I don't know, three or four months where I thought, can I trust you guys? Because all these guys are looking at me like, you're the pastor. <laughs> oh, I'm the pastor, but here goes the sin nature. The main purpose of the D group was to train, though, 
Yes, you do connect with people in the group, and yes, you do build deep friendships, but everyone in the group knows that your purpose is to replicate. So see the difference between the purpose? I'm going to connect with these people, and I'm going to be in that group for the rest of my life, or I'm going to train and send, which is the whole purpose of live sent at the end of every service that we say. So here's the ownership. Either the church owns it or the individual owns it. And I'm not saying the church shouldn't own some things. We kind of own the worship service, right? All the people that, that, that usually preach, which is like me and a couple of other people, usually they're, they're kind of they're, they're either employed by the church or they've been a part of the church for a long time. Who owns this ministry? How do you see your discipleship group? Is it, is it the church's ministry or is it my ministry? Well, the empowerment model, this is your personal ministry with the people in your life, and we want to come alongside of you to support you. How many of you guys have heard of eHarmony? Okay. It's a matchmaking website that kind of hooks you up with somebody. Well, in this model, this ownership, the church being owning the D groups would be more like D Harmony, right? You come, you sign a big list, and I'm going to put you together. How do you think that goes? It might work out one out of ten times, but I can tell you the nine out of ten times, those people don't want to be together because they're not in relationship with each other. They don't trust each other. Individuals take ownership under the empowerment model. The program in the engagement model, the program environment occurs at the church. They're going to tell you when to meet. We're going to do discipleship on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. That's the only time you can do it. We don't want to limit the environment in the empowerment model where they meet. So we want D groups to meet in homes, in Chick-fil-A's, at brew, ba at brew bakers, at baker suites. At any restaurant that will let you in the door. <laughs> we want you to meet at the park. We want them to occur on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Friday. See, the ownership looks different there and the environment, therefore, looks different is that it's relationship-centered. The next one is, who is the leader? Who can lead a D group? For a lot of people, I think they thought it was just the all-stars of the church. And I'm not saying anything about our D group leaders this past time. They were quality people. But you see the difference between the all-star and faithful, available, teachable. I know some of you are like, hey, that sounds good to me. So, right? Faithful, available teacher that I want to lead because I've been faithful to Jesus and I'm available and I'm teachable and I may not know everything. And Bible knowledge is not bad, okay? Being trained is not bad, but that doesn't mean The all-stars are the only one that are invited to the Great Commission. Obviously, Jesus didn't think so. So the importance of it, discipleship is a ministry in the church versus it's prioritized. It is the ministry in the church, and everything flows from that ministry. The growth is either now or future. Discipleship is not a microwave process. It's more like a crock pot, okay? It's going to take some time for these kind of relationships to foster growth. So we're looking for future growth. We're looking for ways that our D group can multiply and replicate. When I started in my D group, I had four other guys with me. By the end of my D group, one of my guys was deployed on the other side of the world. The other, another one was, was being um, sent to officer training school, which is a good thing. Another one is being sent to the mission field which just leaves me and two other people. And some people would be like, Tim, your Bible study is awful. People are leaving. <laughs> or it could mean future growth for the people in France. They might sit down with a member of a D group and have a Bible study, and he already knows how to do it because it's easy to replicate. And what it might mean is that when Justin Tankersley settles down in Pensacola, that he says to some fellas, hey, you guys want to be in a D group? What's a D group? I'll tell you what a D group is. And so it leads to future growth. And then the leadership is customer service versus coach. This is a big one. In customer service, our goal is to ease the pain and discomfort. We want to lower the bar so that we can feel good about it. I'll just tell you, one of the areas in a D group that this hits the road is in the area of scripture memory. 
There was a guy in my D group that promised us that he would study the scripture on his drive there and he would have it memorized word for word. And for somebody who really tried to memorize it, not while driving there, I found that very frustrating, to be honest with you. (laughs) But I had to think to myself, this is not about my comfort and ease. This is about Jesus conforming me. And every coach I've ever had said, if you're not feeling a little pain, I'm not doing my job. Get back on the line, son. (laughs) Run another lap. See, the problem with a lot of discipleship models is that there is no cost. You keep living the way that you're living, and we'll keep telling you that that's okay, but that is not discipleship. Nehemiah did not walk up to the nobles of Tekoa and go, you don't need to work, you're good, let the underlings do the work, right? We don't see that in Scripture. Our goal is to make disciples who make disciples, and we want discipleship to be reproducible so that when some of you guys... PCS to Las Vegas or Pensacola or Germany or Korea or Pensacola that you can take what you've learned and you can replicate it. So what's your next step? Some of you are like, Tim, that, thank you for that lesson. I appreciate it, okay? This, our heart's desire is to be a church that would practice the empowerment model. So that we could set you loose to be in the all-play, everyday disciple-making movement. So now, what are some ways to serve? Let me go through these as quickly as I can. Number one, you need to go through our membership process. We have two classes called Membership Matters, and then you write out your testimony. The membership interview then occurs with an elder or a leader to get to know you, listens to your testimony, makes sure that your baptism is by immersion, that's part of the reason we're Baptist, and that your baptism is on this side of your conversion. These are the steps. There are no shortcuts. There is no quick way through this process. To be honest with you, we use the membership process to make sure that all the members of our church are believers as best as we can discern. Because there are plenty of churches in America and beyond that are full of people on their rolls and they have never, never borne fruit for the gospel's sake. And so from what Jesus has said in the Bible, that would say that they are a bad tree bearing bad fruit, which makes them not regenerate. Number two, if you're a guest... Take the time to get to know the people of the church that you want to be a member of. What I would say to you over and over is come early and stay late. I would say that to all our congregation. My favorite thing at the end of a Sunday is to kick people out of the sanctuary. And what I'll say to them, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So at 1230, we're all kind of ushering them out. But we want to come early and stay late. We want to have relationships with each other. Number three is how can I serve? You come to prayer the first Sunday night of the month and you will see how to serve our church through prayer. Number four, we've experienced significant growth in our children's ministry in the past year, which is wonderful. Amen? As a church, we want to grow in this area because because of this growth, we need more volunteers. Just like Nehemiah needed help to build the wall, we need help to build God's church. I want you to hear this statement. If the majority of our church members served in the children's ministry, just the majority, not 100%, if the majority of our church members served in the children's ministry, each member would only serve nine nine times a year. Which that would be a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, or a Wednesday night. Is nine times a lot in a year? No. (laughs) Just say it out loud. Thank you. Amen. Blesses my heart. It takes 16 people at least to volunteer in the children's ministry each Sunday morning. So let me give you this picture. On a weekly basis, six members volunteer every Sunday, every Sunday, which leaves us needing 10 more volunteers for each Sunday morning which gives us at least two people in each classroom. In order to volunteer, you need to be a member 
and you need to fill out a background check. And when the background check is processed all the way through, you can serve. Why do we do this? To protect our children. Gone are the days of one person in a room with 16 children. Because in those days, that's the scandal that the whole country has heard. Have you seen that in the news? You and I must be vigilant about protecting our little children. And you're like, hey, Tim, I am not in the majority who is able to serve. Then there are other areas for you to serve in. You weren't getting a pass, okay? The people on the wall didn't get a pass. And number five, how can I serve? You can go out to eat with people after church. You can invite them to your home. You can go to sit on a park bench somewhere. You can go to McAllister's. You can go to a variety of people and you can eat with them. If you need, if you're not in your budget, then bring a sandwich and go out to eat with people or invite them into your home. And while you are there, if you're thinking, I don't know them, what am I going to talk about? Why don't you say to them, how did you come to know Jesus? There's an icebreaker. Maybe why the bread's in the oven, maybe why the bread's in the belly, but you would say to them, hey, how did you come to know Jesus? Or is that something you're still working on? That's how you can serve the local church. Amen? All right. Hey, grace to you. But we need all the members for this local church to do what God has called us to do. And that is to reclaim the glory of God in Sumter and in South Carolina and to the nations. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much that you have extended the breath in our lungs. Lord, we thank you that we can learn from Nehemiah chapter 3. It seems like a long list of gates and people, but God, you are doing a work in our own hearts. And today, I pray that we would be freed up to serve you. Father, I thank you for the growth you have brought to our church. I pray that we would continue to be faithful to serve this local church that you have made us a part of until you call us somewhere else. And Father, when we go there, I pray that we would replicate what you have taught us here. Father, as we sing this song, may we lift our voices to you for the glory of of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.